Galatians chapter 5. Go ahead and start uh, turning there. Um, before I tell you uh, what my message is today, I, I didn't plan on this, but I'm continuing on in my theme of song titles, and I don't know why it just keeps coming up like that. So see if you can help me out here. There's a song that says, all we are saying is, you guys know it, give peace a chance. That's awesome. So here we go. Fruit of the Spirit, part six, give peace a a chance. Who, who said that? John Lennon and Yoko Ono, right? Before my time, I read about it. So just kidding. It is before my time. But anyway, that's a whole other story. All right. Is everybody in Galatians chapter 5? We're going to start in verse 13. And as we do every week, we're going to read through our passage. <clears throat> Galatians 5.13, it says, You, my brothers and sisters... We're called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh." For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, here's our key verses right here. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there is no law those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires since we live by the spirit let us keep in step with the spirit let us not become conceited provoking and envying each other so we've said throughout this entire series we have a key statement the one big idea for this entire series is True followers of Jesus will be identified by fruit and sanctification. You should be able to look at the life of a follower of Jesus, and although we have bad days, and although we mess up and all that, you should be able to see fruit in their lives and this growth process of sanctification in their lives. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about love. Last week, we talked about joy. And man, I really enjoyed that message, enjoyed, I enjoyed the joy message. I don't know about you, I have had several conversations, and of course this is what I do, and I'm, I'm pouring my heart into this each week, and I'm studying, I'm studying, I'm studying, but it just really was a great tool, this thing that we talked about last week. I must have had two or three different conversations with people throughout the week that I was able to kind of share some of that, like, hey, joy doesn't have anything to do with our circumstances. That's happy. But joy is this thing, no matter what happens in our circumstances, we can have this joy. And I was just able to share that a few different times. I loved that. But we said this. We said the original Greek word for joy is kara, and it is constant satisfaction and contentment. Those are some big words right there. Constant satisfaction and contentment that doesn't fluctuate due to circumstances because its foundation is found in God's unwavering and unending grace. We can have joy because joy is not found in our circumstances. It's found in our salvation. And 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9 said this, Though you have not seen him, speaking of Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible 
and glorious joy. Well, why, Peter? Why is it that we can be filled with this inexpressible and glorious joy that you talk about? It's so good. How is it that we can have that? I want some of that. Verse 9, for, here's what he's saying. Here's the reason. For, you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Right there it tells us, no matter what happens in this life, You have eternity, you have grace, you have the salvation of your soul through Jesus Christ. That is what brings joy, not your circumstances, not how many zeros are in your bank account, not, oh, you got back together in your relationship, not any of those things, but your eternity provides joy. So, Back into verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and what? Peace. Peace. So this peace thing, it's a pretty big deal, right? Peace is a big deal. We hear about it all the time, right? It's a, um, I think it's a pretty sought after commodity, this peace. Um, True story, aliens come and they visit the earth. Here we go. And guess what? As they ought to, the aliens come in, they come in peace, right? Uh, Oddly enough as well, they speak English. Pretty cool. I don't know how that worked out, but they did. So um, all of the heads of government and, and everybody, they want to meet these aliens and talk to them. But as well as the heads of government, all of the religious leaders of the world, they want to get together with these aliens and talk to them. So of course, the All the heads of state and all the world leaders, they get to meet with them first. And then it's the religious leaders, and they they get to talk to them, and they're, you know, they're kind of, you know, going one by one. And this one really important guy, I won't say who he was, uh, but he he gets to talk to the aliens, and he says, hey, do you have a minute for me to tell you about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And the alien says, oh, you mean JC? (laughs) Yeah, we know JC. That dude is awesome. Man, like, like, like that guy, like, like he, he, he is amazing. Like, he comes to visit us every year on our planet. And this religious leader is like, wait a minute. That, that, that's not right. Like, he hasn't come to our world in more than 2,000 years, and we're still waiting on his return. Like, why does he go to your planet? And about this time, the alien can see that this religious leader is getting a little worked up. And so he's trying to backtrack, right, to keep the peace. He, and and he's, he's thinking, he's like, what can I say that, that, will, that will just make this, you know, a little bit easier? And he says, well, maybe he likes our chocolate better. And the religious leader is like, your chocolate what, what are you talking about? What does this have to do with chocolate? Why would he like your chocolate better? And the alien says, well, when he came to our planet the first time, we gave him a box of chocolate. What did you guys do for him? <laughs> Took a second, didn't it? <clears throat> All right. Bo- we'll talk about that later, honey. <clears throat> Peace, that will not be in my house later. <clears throat> Peace, let me try that again. <clears throat> we talk about it, we sing songs about it, we have bumper stickers about it, right? We march for it. Back in the 60s and 70s, a lot of peace marches. <clears throat> we have all these sayings and these slogans for it, right? We say, peace out. Or if you're really cool, you say, peace out, Girl Scout, but maybe that's just me because I'm from the 90s, okay? Or really, if you're going 90s, we say, peace what? In the... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you didn't even want to say it out loud. I won't look at you, okay? But we would say, peace in the Middle East, I didn't... whatever, right? There's been one that's been around for a couple thousand years, a greeting of peace. What was that? Shalom, okay, there you go, shalom, right? So we have all these sayings and we talk about it and we march forward and bumper stickers and all this stuff. There's not really a lot of peace out there, is there? We haven't been experiencing 
a whole lot of peace at times. Um, According to a, a quick internet search, and of course you can always trust the internet, right now there are 32 ongoing conflicts in the world right now, and they range from drug wars, terrorist insurgencies, ethnic conflicts, and civil wars. 32 major insurgencies, wars, conflicts, unpeaceful situations throughout the world right now. One author says this, he says, peace is that brief glorious moment in history when everybody stands around reloading. It's not a great outlook, is it? But he's almost according to this not wrong. I heard another one said of the last 3,200 recorded years of history, only 8% of the time there has been peace. So is peace really possible? And if it is possible, how do we get this peace? Like how is it that we can come about this peace? Um, There was a reporter and she lived in Jerusalem, and she got this new apartment, and the apartment was overlooking the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. You guys know what that is, right? Okay, so all of these people would go to it every day, mostly Orthodox Jews, but you can go there if you, even if you're a tourist, and you can go, and you can go to the wall, and it's known as this place of prayer. And the, the reason is that it's so important. It is the closest place that the Jews can get to up on the Temple Mount where the temple was. And so they would go there and, and just pray. And this reporter, as she was just sitting out on her balcony every day, uh, watching everybody go by to there, she saw this one gentleman every single day going there to pray. And so it really, it, it, she, she really started thinking like every single day she'd see him. And he was an Orthodox Jew. I mean, he had the, 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 the suit on and he had the hat and, and the beard and the curls and everything. And she recognized him every day. And she's like, I want to interview him. So one day she sees him and she runs down and she asks him, sir, can I interview you? I'm a journalist and I'd love to, to write up something on you. And he said, sure. And so she starts a conversation with him. And um, she says, tell me, what is it when you come here to pray? What are you praying for? And he said, well, actually, I, I pray for three things. I pray for world peace. I pray for the brotherhood of all mankind. And then specifically, I do pray for peace here in the Middle East, that we would have peace. She said, wow, that's awesome. How long have you been coming here, sir? And he said, I've been coming here almost every day for 25 years to pray for these things. And she said, wow, how does it make you feel to come here for 25 years and pray for these things? And he throws his hands up and he's like, it's like talking to a wall. That was better? Okay, good. All right. When it comes to praying about peace, all jokes aside, I think that we often feel like that man. 25 years he's been praying for that and has not yet experienced that peace. Maybe there's, there's little increments of time, but there's something looming in the back of your mind or there's, or there's just complete chaos in your mind. But no matter how much we want it, We just don't have it most of the time. There's this thing called the Global Peace Index, and it's measured using 23 qualitative and quantitative factors. I'm not going to get into all of them. They're very, very detailed. So it measures each country about how much peace they have. Number one would be the most peace-filled country. You want to know where the U.S. is? Of 163 countries listed, We are 131. That's not very peaceful, is it? Considering everything that we know is going around. So if you would, in your Bible, turn to John chapter 14, and we're going to learn a little bit about peace. 
As you're turning there, I'll kind of explain what's going on in this situation. John chapter 14 is part of what's called the upper room discourse. And Jesus and the disciples, they're in the upper room. This is the Last Supper. And he's kind of just giving them the last bit of wisdom and teaching that he can give them. And, and he's talking about all of these things, but they can tell something's really different here. They can tell that things are about to change drastically. Because Jesus says, um, I'm going to die and I'm going to go somewhere else. And, and, and where I'm going, you can't go with me. Now, put yourself in their shoes. They had dropped everything in life. Their careers, relationships, friendships, everything for the last three and a half years to follow Jesus. And Jesus breaks it to them right here. Guys, I'm going to die real soon. I'm going away where I'm going. You can't follow me. It's up to you now. How do you think they felt? Oh, yeah, by the way, they're going to kill me and you're my follower. How do you think that made them feel? So in the midst of that, as the disciples are just crushed, they don't know what they're going to do. Jesus says this, John 14, verse 27. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That's what Jesus tells them in the midst of this. Guys, peace. It's going to be all right. I'm going to leave you my peace. Do you think they got it at that moment? Probably not. But this word peace that Jesus says, the, the original word is irene, and it means peace of mind, quietness, rest, or also another definition is an internal state of tranquility. Now I want you to, we'll do a little exercise here. Take a minute and I want you to just visualize what you see as tranquil. What picture comes to your mind when you think tranquil? Me, it's a very early morning. Now, I probably lost at least half of you right there because you're like, there's nothing tranquil about getting up early in the morning, okay? But that's just me. Really early morning, maybe sitting right on the ocean or the bay, and it is glass calm. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I mean, you can't even see the horizon, and I've got the best cup of coffee in my hand. You've got to throw that one in there, okay? And you don't hear a peep. Maybe every once in a while you'll hear a little ripple from the water hitting the beach. Maybe you'll hear a bird chirp. And you can just sit there and it's like the day and its troubles haven't started yet. To me, that's tranquility. That's my happy place right there. And this irene is an internal state of tranquility. Whatever the most peaceful thing that you could possibly think of, having that as your state of being inside of you at all times, that's what this peace is. That's the peace that Jesus is trying to say, hey guys, I know things are about ready to change and go pretty south at least for about three days. But don't worry. There's this peace that you can have inside of you, this tranquility that you can have. Irene, it's where we get the, the name Irene. Irene just means peaceful one. It's also a greeting. They would, they would just, you know, say Irene to each other. Uh, in fact, Paul does this all the time. One example is 2 Corinthians 1, 2. He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember how Paul does that? He opens up almost all of his letters with that grace and peace to you. That's what Paul's saying, Irene, the state of tranquility, just peace, not worrying about the things around you. And before the Greeks, we mentioned it earlier, there was a Hebrew greeting of peace, and that is shalom. 
Shalom, peace, or peace be with you. Go in peace. It was this greeting that they had. So in John 14, 27, let's break this down a little bit, these first two parts. He says, peace I leave with you. What exactly does that mean? Like, can you hold peace? Can you actually package it up and wrap it in a box and give it to someone? Not exactly. But that's what Jesus is saying here. Peace I leave with you. Jesus is, is basically, it's, it's like he's depositing peace on them. Or it, it's like he's saying, I'm giving you a gift of peace. And as we read this verse, don't just say this was a dialogue between he and the disciples. As well, this is a dialogue between he and us. So he says, peace. I want to give you this peace as a gift, as something tangible, as something that you can have. In the New Living Translation, it says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. I like that. I like how that says that. I'm I'm just going to leave you here with this gift. Now, like joy last week, I think if I were to, after service, set up a table in the lobby and sell peace for really cheap, I'd have a lot of customers, wouldn't I? Like every single one of us should be lined up right there at that table to buy some peace because this peace is good, good stuff. But... What if you are in a pretty peaceless place? What if that's your life right now? What if, what if there are certain areas in your life that not only have no peace, but are really more probably filled with chaos? What if that's you? What do you do at that point? Jesus, it's great, man. That's awesome. You want to give me this peace thing? That's great. Give it to me. But I'm just not feeling it right now. What do we do? So it says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. He makes it personal here. And this is weird how he says this because it doesn't really make sense that Jesus could take some of his peace and give it to us. He's promising us peace, but here's the interesting thing. This promise of peace is coming from the Prince of Peace. How can Jesus say, hey, I'm going to give you my peace? Because he's known as the Prince of Peace. Where do we get that? Where, or, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll make it even easier. When do we usually hear about the Prince of Peace? Christmas. Anybody know what uh, book that's found in? Isaiah, that's right. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. So how can Jesus say, my peace I give to you? How can Jesus give away his peace? What he's saying is, my personal peace that I have inside of me, the peace that I own, that's the peace that I want to give. The peace, Jesus would say, that governs my life, that's the exact same peace that I want to give you. I heard it said like this, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is the manufacturer and the distributor of peace. Now that makes it a little more understandable. When he says, my peace I give to you, understanding that Jesus is the prince of peace and all peace comes from him, he manufactures peace and he distributes peace to us. And he is telling every single one of us this morning, that peace that I have, 
that peace that allowed me to endure everything that I did, that's the peace that I want to give to you. Jesus, as we look at his life, he was a pretty halfway decent example for us to live, right? Yeah? That was sarcasm. Okay. <clears throat> yes, he showed emotion when Lazarus died. It says he wept. And yes, when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying so hard and so stressed that he was sweating drops of blood. So yes, he was a man just like us in that way. He showed emotion, but... Can you think of a time in Scripture where Jesus was anxious or when he lacked peace? Can you think of any time? I'll give you a hint. You can't. There is no time in Scripture. Now, me, let me just tell you, if I had to go through what Jesus did, any one of us, no peace whatsoever, Look at this. In John chapter 19, you don't have to turn there. It'll be on the screen. But John chapter 19, Jesus is, this is just before he's crucified. He's standing before Pilate. He's being sentenced. You want to talk about a time to not have any peace because he knew his fate. And watch what Jesus does. In verse 7, it says, the Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law. And according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. Now, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I want to go off on this verse right here and just preach from this verse. I'm going to refuse, but don't ever let anyone tell you that Jesus did not claim to be God. Okay, this verse, again, I'm not going to do it. Verse 8, when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid and went back inside the palace where do you come from, he asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said. Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Now, here's the moment. Let's just say if Trevor endured everything else, the beating and, and all of that, and I'm standing before Pilate, let's just say if I made it to this point, this is my breaking moment right here. That this guy says, he reveals to me, don't you realize, because you know your fate, don't you realize I can either have you crucified right now today or I can set you free. I would have crumbled right there, just being honest. But is that what Jesus did? No. What did the Prince of Peace say? He doesn't beg for his life. He doesn't, uh, none of that. Verse 11, he said, Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. That's peace. That's understanding the Father's will and caring about nothing more than the Father's will. That is an internal state of tranquility. So just a few hours earlier than that, when Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, he knew exactly what was coming as he is giving a speech to his disciples about peace. Peace. That's the Prince of Peace. So this peace that Jesus has, he wants to gift it to us. He wants to give us his peace. How? That's the big question, right? How? That's great. This peace that you're talking about, Trev, sounds amazing. I could use some. How do I get it? I'm so glad you asked. Through his Spirit living in us. It's that simple. I know, I, I wish I had like this big revelation and oh, you mean to say it's the same basic thing you've been saying each week in the fruit of the Spirit that if we allow God's Spirit to rule and reign in our lives that, that we will have love, we will have joy, we will have peace and we will have, a, yep, sorry, I don't have this big revelatory thing. It's just allowing God to do in us what he wants to do. 
That's how we have this peace. That's how we look at our situations in life, and it doesn't make our bad things go away. But it makes those bad things in our lives look much smaller in view of eternity, in view of the joy that we can have because of His grace. This next statement is the application. It is worth the money that you paid to get in here. Like it is, if I want you to remember one thing from today, this is it right here. The degree to which you allow God to rule and reign in your life is directly related to the amount of peace you will experience in life. That's it, church. That's up to you. Jesus is standing there going, I want to give you my peace. It's a gift. I want to hand it to you. I want you to have it. I'll read it again. The degree to which you allow God to rule and reign in your life. That's the hard part right there, church. And I know if you figured that out yet, you probably did. But we've got to let God do what God wants to do in our lives. And again, those problems, those issues that we have in life, they shrink. They don't go away. But suddenly we've got our eyes focused on something else. Something much, much better. The degree to which you allow God to rule and reign in your life is directly related to the amount of peace you will experience in life. Alexander McLaren said it like this, peace comes not from the absence of trouble, but from the presence of God. It's so true, church. There was a book published in 1974. Maybe you guys have heard about it. It's called Peace Child by Don Richardson. Everybody heard, anybody ever heard this story? Don Richardson, Peace Child, a couple of you guys. Don Richardson was a Canadian missionary. And he decided he wanted to go all the way to the jungles of New Guinea to uh, minister to the Sawi tribe, S-A-W-I. And so he moved his entire family there to New Guinea. There's only one problem. The Sawi tribe, they were cannibals. So he intentionally moved his family to New Guinea to live amongst and minister to and show the love of Jesus to cannibals. That's peace. That's boldness. The problem with them, other than the fact that they were cannibals, is that their value of virtue was not like ours. To them, virtue, like like to us, is love and kindness and peace and all of that. Those virtues were not virtues to them. To them, the greatest virtue was to befriend, betray, murder, and eat a member of another tribe. That was the most virtuous thing that they could do. It's a little different, isn't it? And so here we go. We've got Richardson going and living amongst them, and he's actually able to befriend some of these guys from the Sawi tribe. And he learns their language, and he loves them as well as he can, and he teaches them different skills. Uh, skills, and he had brought some tools, and they were very interested in the tools that he used, so he actually built a bit of a relationship with them. But he had a problem. When he would try to share the gospel with them, he would tell of the story of Jesus, and he would say, there was this guy, and he, he, he lived among us on this earth, and Um, He was betrayed, and he died, but he rose again, and he took away your sins. 
And because their worldview was so upside down, guess who was the hero of their story? Judas. Judas was actually the hero of the story because he betrayed his friend. That's what these people knew. So Richardson was kind of at a standstill on how to really share Christ's love with them until he learned of a tradition, something that they do. The only thing that was somewhat virtuous that would bring peace amongst these fighting cannibalistic tribes was that a family from one tribe would take one of their children and give it to the other tribe known as a peace child. And as long as that child lived, there would be peace among these tribes. And Richard said, I know of another peace child that was given. So he was able to share with them, hey, so this Jesus I was telling you about, see, everybody was at war with or enemies with God. We sinned against him. We did, we did awful, awful things against him. We were enemies. But God sent a peace child to this world. And they finally were able to understand the love that God has. This offering of peace that God offers every single one of us. Richardson says, at that point, some of them actually got it. Also, thankfully, they realized Judas was not the hero of the story. But peace, a lot of bumper stickers about it, a lot of sayings about it, slogans, we have fun with it. Have you seen the, there's bumper stickers, there's like a peace sign, you know, the kind of the thing. Or you see maybe a bumper sticker and it's just the two fingers. There's also a really popular sticker. I have no idea where it comes from. It's a frog throwing a peace sign. Maybe you guys know what that is. I have no idea, but you see that all the time. Um, I saw a bumper sticker. It says, we'll work for peace. Okay, sure. Um, Here's another bumper sticker I saw recently. Um, it's It's a quote. It says, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. Anybody know who said that? I think that was, I don't know, the one I saw was Jimi Hendrix. There's also one, it's got the peace symbol and a heart, so peace, love, and then you kind of fill in like, you know, there's dogs. So peace, love, and dogs, or another one that I saw recently was peace, love, and the Bucky's symbol. I don't know, I don't know if Bucky's is that good, <clears throat> right? But there's, there's one I think that stands above the rest. And I think that really summarizes what we're trying to say here. And I know all of you have seen it before. And it's this. No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. I know it's cliche. I know it's been around for a really long time. And, and, but it's true. If you have no Jesus in your life, guess what? I hate to break it to you. You'll have some happy. Okay, you'll have some moments of rest. But you're never going to have joy and you're never going to have true peace. But if you know Jesus, if you allow him to rule and reign in your life, Where you wake up every morning and you say, Jesus, the answer is yes, now tell me the question. When you get to that point in your life, you will know peace. Ultimate peace. One last time here, and we're done. The degree to which you allow God to rule and reign in your life is directly related to the amount of peace you will experience in life. Let's pray.
Jesus, thank you so much that you were obedient and you came to this earth as the peace child. Thank you, God, that, that you allowed him to come to be that point of peace between us. God, we were at war with you. God, we choose to sin against you. But your word says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. <clears throat> God, I know that there are some in here who just don't have peace in their lives. It looks a lot more like chaos. God, would you bring your peace, your peace from the Prince of Peace into our lives? God, help us to keep our eyes focused on the right things. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you. God, I know in a room this large, there are some who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Right now, God, would you speak to their hearts? God, speak to them in that still, small voice so that they would know that they need you. Right now in this moment, would they say, God, I need you. God, I want you to rule and reign in my life. God, save me. God, change me. God, I trust that your son Jesus died for me, that he was the peace child. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If anybody said that this morning, if you're ready to give your life to Jesus, I'd love to know about it. I'm not going to call you out or make any commotion, but I'd just love to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up? Say, I got it today. I started a relationship with Jesus today. Thank you. Anyone else? Today's the day that I want to have peace with God. God, thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are love and that you bring peace to us. God, help us to live in peace and live in such a way that people will see us and see the difference in us. They will have to understand that it is just you. God, we pray for this time of offering. Use it in amazing ways, Lord. Help us to further your kingdom in this community and in this world. We love you, Jesus, and it is in your amazing name that we pray.